In response to a massive rocket attack from Hamas militants, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has called upon residents of the Gaza Strip to immediately evacuate. Netanyahu pledged to use the full might of the Israeli Defense Forces, IDF, to destroy the potential threat from the Hamas terrorist group. He described the events as unprecedented and promised that such an attack would not happen again. Netanyahu vowed to win the war but acknowledged that the price would be high. Israel's defense minister Yov Gallant threatened to change the reality in the Gaza Strip for the next 50 years, emphasizing that Hamas would pay for its actions. The death toll from the attack has risen to over 250 people, with at least 1,450 injured, many in critical condition. The situation continues to evolve, with international reactions, including support from Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky and promises of assistance from the Pentagon. The Israel Defense Forces, IDF, have reportedly regained control over most settlements in the country's south, including those along the border with the Gaza Strip that were infiltrated by Hamas and Islamic Jihad militants. The settlements mentioned include Steret, Sofa, Karim Shalom, Nairim, Nazif Hadra, Niraz, Nakalaz Outpost, Hewlett, Nir Am, Nir Yitzhak, Bir Shiva, SD Yemen, Megan, and Urim. Defense Minister Yov Gallant declared a state of emergency throughout Israel. Earlier, a special situation mode had been announced within an 80 kilometers radius from the Gaza Strip, allowing military authorities to restrict gatherings and block off districts. The move comes in response to a large-scale rocket attack by Hamas militants, leading to fires in Israeli cities. The death toll from the attack has risen to over 200, with more than 1,100 people injured. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin expressed the U.S.'s strong support for Israel and its commitment to ensuring that Israel has what it needs to defend itself. Austin mentioned closely monitoring developments in Israel and extended condolences to the families of victims in the recent attack by Palestinian militants. The U.S. is a steadfast ally of Israel, providing around $3.8 billion annually, and Austin emphasized the unwavering commitment to Israel's right to defend itself. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu declared war against Palestinian militant groups after a surprise, multifrontal attack by Hamas. The recent violence adds to the long-standing conflict between Israel and Palestine, with tensions escalating in recent months. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu conveyed to U.S. President Joe Biden during a conversation on Saturday that Israel anticipates the need for a substantial military campaign. The statement from Netanyahu's office highlighted Biden's expression of support for Israel and its right to self-defense. Netanyahu thanked Biden for the unwavering support and emphasized the necessity of a prolonged and significant campaign to secure Israel's victory. In a separate statement, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken unequivocally condemned Hamas attacks on Israel, including civilians and communities, and pledged to maintain close contact with Israeli partners. The EU and Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky have also condemned the violence, while the US has committed to providing necessary support for Israel's defense. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky expressed his condolences to those affected by the recent terrorist attacks in Israel. He condemned terrorism as a crime against humanity and emphasized the need for global unity to prevent its spread. Zelensky affirmed Israel's unquestionable right to self-defense and called for solidarity to ensure that terrorism does not threaten lives anywhere in the world. He urged Ukrainians in the affected area to follow security forces' instructions and information from local authorities. French President Emmanuel Macron condemned the attacks against Israel and discussed the situation with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas, and other regional leaders. Macron expressed concerns over the situation and emphasized the importance of unequivocally condemning terrorist attacks against Israel. The French presidency stated that Macron had also talked with Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi and Lebanon's caretaker Prime Minister Najib Mukadi. Macron reiterated France's solidarity with Israel, emphasizing the commitment to Israeli security and the right to self-defense. Abbas urged Macron to intervene to stop what he described as Israeli aggression against Palestinians. Brazilian President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva expressed hopes to prevent the escalation of the conflict between Israel and Hamas. Brazil, currently holding the rotating presidency of the UN Security Council, condemned the surprise Hamas attack on Israel and called for an emergency meeting of the Security Council to address the crisis. 
The country reaffirmed its commitment to a two-state solution for Israelis and Palestinians coexisting within mutually agreed and internationally recognized borders. President Lula stated that Brazil would spare no efforts to prevent an escalation of the conflict during its tenure as president of the UN Security Council. The Brazilian government urged all parties to exercise maximum restraint to avoid a further escalation of the situation. Diplomats mentioned that the Security Council is expected to meet on Sunday. Former Russian President Dmitry Medvedev commented on the widespread attacks by Hamas on Israel, describing them as an expected development. Medvedev used the opportunity to denounce U.S. influence in the Middle East and in Ukraine. He criticized the U.S. for not actively working on a Palestinian-Israeli settlement and accused them of interfering with Russia and supporting neo-Nazis. Medvedev questioned what could stop America's manic obsession to incite conflicts all over the planet. Meanwhile, governments in Europe and the U.S. pledged support for Israel amid rising violence, while nations in the Middle East mostly condemned Israel for its role in the conflict with Palestine. Medvedev's comments on Ukraine come in the context of wavering support for arming Ukraine against Russian invasion, with debates in Congress over funding and concerns about Ukraine's counteroffensive. Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Iran have appeared to blame Israel for the escalating conflict with Hamas. Saudi Arabia expressed concern over the situation and warned of the dangers of the continued occupation, emphasizing the importance of addressing the legitimate rights of the Palestinian people. This condemnation comes as both Israel and Saudi Arabia have attempted to normalize relations in recent years. An Iranian government advisor explicitly endorsed Hamas, congratulating the Palestinian fighters and expressing support until the liberation of Palestine and Jerusalem. Iran has a history of funding and supplying Hamas in its conflict with Israel. Qatar also blamed Israel for the violence, holding it responsible for the current escalation due to ongoing violations of the rights of the Palestinian people, particularly citing raids on the Al-Aqsa Mosque. The U.S. has pledged support for Israel in the conflict. Hamas claims to be holding Israeli commanders hostage amid reports that around 50 civilians have been kidnapped by gunmen near the Gaza border. Salah al arari deputy head of Hamas's political bureau, stated that senior officers had been captured, suggesting they could be used as leverage to secure the release of Palestinians held in Israeli jails. Pictures circulated on social media purportedly showed Maj Gen Nimrod Aloni, a former commander of the Israeli Defense Forces Gaza Division, being led through the streets by Hamas fighters. The IDF later denied that a major general had been captured. The hostages were reportedly taken from several locations near the Gaza Strip border, and some were claimed to have been brought into Palestinian territory. Hamas fighters paraded the naked body of a woman through the streets in the back of a pickup truck on Saturday. The woman, later identified as Shani Luke, had reportedly been attending an outdoor music festival near Kibbutz Urim when militants stormed the area. Distressing videos of the scene spread on social media, showing armed men sitting on the woman's corpse as they shouted, Allah Akbar, from the open back of the truck. Some in the crowd spat on the woman's body before the truck sped away. Hamas also claimed to be holding Israeli commanders hostage, and reports indicated that around 50 Israeli civilians had been kidnapped by gunmen near the Gaza border. World leaders decried the killing of civilians in the ongoing conflict. Ismail Haniyeh, the leader of Hamas, addressed Arab countries on Saturday, stating that Israel cannot offer them protection despite recent diplomatic normalization. Hamas launched a significant attack on Israel, combining gunmen entering Israel with a barrage of rockets from the Gaza Strip. In his speech, Haniyeh warned Arab nations that normalization agreements with Israel wouldn't resolve the Palestinian conflict, emphasizing that Israel couldn't protect itself in the face of resistance. He also mentioned that armed Palestinian factions intend to expand the ongoing battle from Gaza to the West Bank and Jerusalem. Palestinian officials are defending the Saturday attack on Israel, emphasizing warnings about the consequences of blocking the political horizon and the need for Palestinians to exercise their legitimate right to self-determination. The attack, orchestrated by Hamas, caught Israel by surprise, leading to a significant military operation in Gaza. Palestinian officials claim at least 232 dead in Gaza and over a thousand wounded. The UN human rights chief called for an immediate stop to violence. Hamas released a statement on its Telegram channel, framing the operation as defending against Israeli occupation. Hamas called on Arab and Islamic nations to join the fight, presenting it as a religious battle against Israel.
The international community, including the U.S., has condemned the assault, pledging support for Israel's defense. Iran's foreign ministry characterized Hamas's attacks on Israel as an act of self-defense by Palestinians, urging Muslim countries to support their rights. The spokesperson stated that the operation is a spontaneous movement of resistance groups and Palestinians defending their rights against Zionist aggression. A top advisor to Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei asserted that the attacks would expedite the collapse of the Zionist regime. Iran state media emphasized that the attacks demonstrated Israel's vulnerability and the initiative being in the hands of Palestinian youth. Iranian officials and lawmakers expressed support for the Palestinian cause, with scenes of jubilation and anti-Israel chants in Tehran and other cities across Iran. Turkish Foreign Minister Hakan Fidan engaged in calls with regional counterparts, including Saudi, Qatari, Iranian, Palestinian, and Egyptian officials, to discuss the Israel-Palestine conflict. Turkey expressed strong condemnation for the loss of civilian lives, urged restraint, and emphasized the need to prevent further escalation. The foreign ministry stated that Turkey is ready to provide any necessary help to control and de-escalate the situation, maintaining intensive contacts with relevant parties. This development comes as Turkey seeks to normalize ties with Israel after years of tension, with the two countries exchanging ambassadors in 2020 after a period of strained relations. Migrants in a closed camp on the Greek island of Samos celebrated the recent attacks by Hamas on Israel, with videos showing Palestinians and other asylum seekers cheering. The camp, surrounded by barbed wire, reportedly echoed with chants of Allah Akbar as residents expressed support for the attacks. Similar celebrations were observed in various states across the Arab world, including Tehran, where supporters waved Palestinian flags and set off fireworks. Hezbollah supporters in Beirut and Palestinian refugee camps also joined the celebrations. In Berlin, police increased their presence due to fears of potential attacks on synagogues following Palestinian supporters taking to the streets. Some in Britain expressed support for the attacks on social media, while the head of the Palestinian mission to the UK cautioned against interpretations of Israel's right to self-defense as a green light for further actions against Palestine. Cyprus authorities arrested Russian journalist Alexander Gasyuk, citing security reasons. The journalist, associated with Rossiyskaya Gazeta newspaper, will reportedly be deported after his residency permit is revoked. The arrest led to allegations of excessive force, which Cyprus authorities denied, stating that Gasyuk resisted arrest. The Russian foreign ministry demanded a formal apology from Cyprus, considering the arrest a provocation. Cyprus, addressing national security concerns, is in communication with the Russian government to resolve the matter. The incident adds strain to Cyprus-Russia relations, already strained by Cyprus denying Russian naval vessels entry following Moscow's invasion of Ukraine. Ramzan Kadyrov, the head of Russia's Chechnya region and a close ally of President Vladimir Putin, suggested postponing or limiting the 2024 presidential election due to the war in Ukraine. Kadyrov proposed either having a single candidate, Vladimir Putin, or temporarily calling off the elections. The statement was made during a rally in Grozny marking Putin's birthday. The suggestion comes amid Putin's significant challenges and failures in the Ukraine conflict, making the political landscape less predictable. Putin has not yet confirmed whether he will run for re-election, but he has been a dominant figure in Russian politics for over two decades. The armed forces of Ukraine are conducting counter-battery combat, targeting Russian warehouses and successfully striking the Russian rear on the Kherson front. The Ukrainian troops continue defensive actions in the east and south, along with an offensive operation on the Melitopol and Bakhmut fronts. The Russians launched missile strikes on Kharkiv, resulting in casualties and damage to civilian infrastructure. A total of three missile and 67 airstrikes, along with 46 attacks from multiple launch rocket systems, were recorded. The Ukrainian forces repelled attacks, inflicted losses on the Russians, and continue their assault actions, consolidating positions along the entire line of contact. The Ukrainian air force and rocket forces targeted Russian military personnel, weapons, equipment, and anti-aircraft missile systems. President Joe Biden is considering a one-and-done spending bill to fund the war in Ukraine until the next presidential election, aiming to overcome opposition from Republicans. The White House plans to ask Congress for its largest funding package ever for weapons and humanitarian aid, potentially reaching $100 billion. 
The move is an attempt to avoid ongoing debates over Ukraine spending and prevent further damage to President Biden's standing in the 2024 election. The proposal faces opposition from some Republicans, and concessions may be needed for the request to pass a vote in the House. Satellite imagery indicates a significant increase in rail traffic along the North Korea-Russia border, with around 73 freight cars observed at Tumangang Rail Station. The surge is considered unprecedented and suggests potential arms supply by North Korea to Russia. The heightened rail activity follows discussions on deeper military cooperation between North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and Russian President Vladimir Putin during a recent summit. The US and South Korea have expressed concerns about possible violations of UN sanctions and the exchange of military support between North Korea and Russia. The United States has expelled two Russian diplomats from Moscow's embassy in response to Russia's expulsion of two US diplomats last month. The US State Department declared the Russian diplomats persona non grata, emphasizing that such actions were a response to Russia's harassment of American diplomats. Tensions between the two countries remain high, particularly due to Russia's military actions in Ukraine. The recent expulsions come amid a series of diplomatic exchanges, reflecting the strained relationship between the US and Russia. Yaroslav Kaczynski, Poland's deputy prime minister and ruling party leader, emphasized that Poland's military security relies on its own strong army and its alliance with the United States. Kaczynski, speaking at a campaign rally, highlighted the importance of having a robust national defense and a strong partnership with the U.S., considering it the only country capable of providing significant assistance. Poland, viewing Russia as a growing threat, has been a vocal supporter of Ukraine and advocates for a substantial U.S. presence in Europe. Kaczynski stressed the need for Poland to be capable of self-defense to encourage U.S. support and ensure the country's safety. The United States is exploring a potential three-way exchange involving the transfer of the Iron Dome missile defense system to Poland in exchange for Poland providing Ukraine with some Patriot air defense systems. This arrangement is considered as a workaround after Israel rejected requests from the US and Ukraine for the Iron Dome. Democratic Senator Chris Van Hollen is reportedly involved in proposing this exchange. The plan involves Poland, a NATO member, receiving Iron Dome systems and providing Ukraine with Patriot systems. The consideration of alternative arrangements comes amid ongoing discussions on military assistance to Ukraine. A powerful magnitude, 6.3 earthquake struck western Afghanistan, causing significant casualties and destruction. The UN provided a preliminary figure of 320 dead, but local authorities estimated around 100 people killed and 500 injured. The quake's epicenter was near Herat City, with four villages in the Zenda Jan district of Herat province bearing the brunt. The U.S. Geological Survey reported three strong aftershocks. Search and rescue efforts are ongoing, and the number of casualties is expected to rise. The earthquake also affected nearby Afghan provinces, and the Taliban urged local organizations to provide assistance in the affected areas. Turkish security forces launched attacks on Kurdish militants in northern Syria and eastern Turkey following a rocket attack on a Turkish base by the Syrian Kurdish YPG militia. The Turkish military neutralized 26 Kurdish militants in northern Syria, destroyed 30 targets, and conducted airstrikes in the region. In eastern Turkey, two PKK militants were neutralized during an operation. The tensions escalated further after the US shot down a Turkish drone near its troops in Syria, leading to a call between Turkish Foreign Minister Hakan Fidan and U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken. The PKK had claimed responsibility for a recent bombing in Ankara. Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan stated during an AK Party Congress that he does not recognize LGBT and pledged to combat trends he views as aiming to destroy the family institution in the country. Erdogan and his government have adopted a stricter stance on LGBTQ freedoms, particularly in the run-up to the May elections. While homosexuality is not illegal in Turkey, there is widespread hostility toward it, and police crackdowns on pride parades have become more severe over the years. Erdogan has frequently referred to members of the LGBTQ community as deviants.